Welcome back to Sonic Speaks, where we interview the makers and shapers of audio drama today. And speaking of today, I have an incredible couple of guests of which I could take up all our interview time reading their achievements. But in the interest of brevity and the Second Amendment, I will attempt to bring only the bullet points. Richard Fish has been a tireless advocate of radio drama and community radio with his longtime work. Happy 30th anniversary past Richard, Firehouse Theatre, who is going to speak on the amazing release here on Mutual of his collaboration with Norman Corwin, Between Americans. And Mr. David Osman, one of the founding members of America's premier audio comedy troupes, Fire Sign Theatre. With Peter Bergman, Philip Proctor, and Phil Austin, their work dominated the 70s and has continued to reach out their influence on some of the great audio dramatists today all the way through the decades. Welcome, gentlemen, to Sonic Speaks. It's my great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's let's start off, if we could, um, with David. Um, I got to tell you a couple of things first. Number one. I am ashamed as a Canadian that they did not play Fire Sign Theatre when I was a child, and I didn't know anything about it until I became an adult. And so I feel robbed. Uh, I feel uh, angry. Um, I've written to my premier and my prime minister on the situation. They have yet to respond. Uh, but I remember years ago when I, the first time I heard it, we had a, I was at the Universalist Unitarian Church here in Halifax, and I was talking, just starting to work on uh, doing my show, and I was talking about audio drama and comedy, and my minister was out of the States, and he said, oh, you mean like Fire Sign Theater? And of course, I started looking, because I was wondering, he just wanted me to check all the exits. I didn't know what he was talking about, fire signs. So, um, but I had no idea. And then years later, when I started going, I met with John Bell from Bells in the Bat Free, and Kai and Chris Conroy uh, from Technical Difficulties, and they both spoke of Fire Sign Theater with such reverence. I had to go and find out what you guys are, and now I know why. It struck <laughs> me very much as, as a Canadian, we have connections to the States, or to England as well, and it reminded me very much of The Goon Show uh, in that kind of surrealistic view. So, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the origins? And I, I've done some reading since then, but I'm sure some of our listeners need to know. Well, you're right about the Goon Show. It was, uh, we all four of us, when we met and we met on the radio, uh, which was appropriate for the Firesign Theater. Um, and actually, <laughs> Peter Bergman had a radio program called Radio Free Oz on the community station KPFK in Los Angeles. He had come out of nowhere to suddenly be the biggest radio voice in L.A., went from FM to AM uh, very shortly after uh, after this because he also produced and appeared. We all appeared at the very first love in. So this was this was your deep hippie times. And uh, and uh, uh, we the uh, Phil Proctor, who was on the road uh, in, doing plays and Phil Austin, who was in doing theater in Los Angeles. Uh, we just loved Pete's show. And so we would tune in, Phil and I, and we'd go down there. Phil was the producer and, you know, on air guy. And I'd drop in and do my thing. And then Pete's old friend from uh, Yale came into town, uh, Phil Proctor. And he'd drop in because it was just so amazing. And one night, all four of us were there. And Peter suggested we do something called uh, a, a film festival. We thought on radio, this is a great idea. And uh, uh, so we began showing our, we all were, of course, playing two or three other people. And uh, we started showing our movies, uh, which was very entertaining on radio and discussing them. And uh, then uh, Phil Austin came up with a character called Jack Love. And suddenly it, it, this was not a film that was appropriate to show to a mixed audience. And so Peter said, we got to <laughs> shut this movie down. Took a, you know, we'd stop showing the movie. The phones rang immediately. People say, how can you censor that? And the four of us looked at each other and said, we did it. They believe anything we say. And that was really the beginning of how powerful the medium was for all of us. As far as, you know, as far as our own audio background yes we all had the goon show in common and it was it was that ability to move 
just with a, a bang and a crash from place to place to play multiple characters. I, you know, I, I was learning to from Peter Sellers how to do this voice, you know, because it was a very, very good voice for me to do this. <laughs> And all and and you know, the old man, you know, all of all of that stuff was very much available in British comedy, not in American comedy. Right. So when we when Peter was asked to do uh, a record album by a producer at Columbia, and they they wanted him to do a, um, a, a you know an astrology album, something was really hip at the moment, and he said, "No, I've got this comedy group." And, and uh, he didn't have a comedy group at all. He, we just had some fun on the radio, but they gave him some money. He sent Phil Proctor a ticket and Proctor showed up and he said, Pete said, well, we're going to do an album called Waiting for the Electrician or someone like him. Start writing, you know, and uh, and and that was how we spent the summer of 1967 writing the, uh, the that album, which is a real picture of America uh politically culturally at as of that moment and and the future um we felt that this was our lucky album you know we didn't feel we were ever going to do any of this again but the next album had nick danger on it and it was so successful that we kept on contract then for the next uh eight years i guess it was until finally we weren't selling enough records and uh and uh, and they they did not pick up another contract. So uh, not selling when you say not selling the same records is that after the Not Insane album because that had a lot of controversy. That was seventy three, I think, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, well, seventy three was a mixed year for us because uh, uh, both because uh, uh, really was before that the Dear Friends album, which was excerpts uh funny things from the radio show we really needed an album that you could play comfortably on the radio drop-ins you know right. uh because radio play was what was happening so you had to hit that market uh and i you know we were really a rock and roll band so when i talk about markets and all this stuff i'm talking in the in the vernacular of the day we were they treated us like a rock band we we went out and promoted our records like a rock band for all those years. So, uh, and really our association was with the music of the time, not with the comics of the time. Somebody, I, I picked up a Shelley Berman record the other day and it was, I and posted it and I said, this was the most discarded thrift store record of the moment. And it's exactly the album that we wanted not to do that we did not want our records ever thrown away because we wanted them to be so complicated and so interesting and so much fun that you'd want to play it more than twice. Right. right. And that that finally was, that was a, another motivating factor. Uh, there, was, um, there was very little at, at that moment in the mid 60s, let's say, <clears throat> that would possibly uh otherwise inspire us i mean we were closer to uh to uh, uh Fibber, mcgee and molly right you know in a sense to that kind of old radio and that and that's where nick danger comes from is from our from our classic american radio uh blowing that up i dropped my script uh, what well, you know it's all the kinds of jokes that really did happen Right inside a theater, inside a, a, a radio broadcast situation, and we recorded it in Studio B at Columbia Records with with a Hammond B three organ that wow. had been there since the since the forties. That's amazing. And, and so it was. We were. It was all real then. It was none of it was nostalgia. It was absolutely real. Right. And and that, I think, is an important aspect because everything since then has been a nostalgic reach back. Forgive me for saying we were we did it first, but in fact, we did do it first. You know, yeah. no, I agree. And and I love the fact like you, you talked about, you know, the drop in the script and, and a lot of what Firesign Theater is brilliant about is a lot of the in jokes and the inside jokes that happens within various different sketches and scripts because you, you don't talk down to your listeners that way right you're, you're that's what i mean when you have to listen to something 
over and over again, you're picking up things that you missed the first time, right? And that that's yeah. that's the cleverness of what you guys have done. And I that really was it. Why, that. why we we had during that summer, uh, Sergeant Pepper came up, and we had a we actually had a mono tape of it. it. Wasn't the first thing that we had that we were listening to, and we played it over and over as we were working, saying we want this kind of album that you want to play over and over because you, it's just so much fun to listen to, you know. And, and that would have gone for the previous one or two Beatles albums as well, but certainly Sgt. Pepper, which had it, all of the, listen to all the technical stuff. It had all of the bands linked. It had real sounds, it had, or it had all this mix, you know, who wouldn't fabulously envy that? And they did it with four track and we were doing with four track too, and then eight and then 16. And so finally we had enough, tracks that you know you start at first by bouncing sounds and you're not in control of, of it you know uh but we had wonderful engineers at columbia records pro engineers and uh, our first instruction to them was nothing that we're going to end up with is going to be the kind of sound you want to record everything we do is degraded sound it's either on television it's a movie it's in the street it's in a you know right and and uh, and in fact, they'd never done that before. You know, the, everything is recorded flat, of course, but it all depends on what, where we're going with it. So, right. and we had six really wonderful years with, with those engineers at Columbia, and which allowed us to do this. And the reason nobody else did this is because, and there were two or three groups that could have entered this, the market, you know? Hmm. But uh, it, it was, it just wasn't going to happen beyond a first album right. for, for almost all of those groups. And they, they were pals and, you know, we were contemporaries and they recorded, they performed live. Uh, but it was never going to jump to albums. We were very, very lucky. And also that we were on Columbia, which had a masterworks side to the label. Right. Rather than being on something uh, on a you know something was just happening like Warner Brothers you know or something like that which is oh let's reinvent audio you know uh, no it was uh, they were reinventing rock and roll and we were just part of it well and I'm glad you evoked uh, the Beatles because you're you're certainly been been that's been an interesting selection a lot of people have compared you to sort of the Beatles of of America and I think in in a very fair way of suggesting that same kind of inventive experimentalism that is involved so the, the idea of rock and roll radio drama does not it sounds it sounds perfectly right to me when you talk about how inventive you guys have been for that reason and I guess the idea was to have the four of you like the fab four from England in that respect too well, you know, well, yeah. it, 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 oh, go, go, go ahead, Rich, Richard. Yeah, just to, just to interject, the archivist of the Library of Congress here in America called the Firesign Theater the Beatles of Comedy and put them in the official uh, library of uh, culturally significant recording. Yeah. Not only that, but culturally significant pieces of paper. Uh, we del we delivered uh, a, 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 no, 22 boxes from me alone, wow. which included uh, uh, day books and included, uh, you know, a, a, a whole, it's just wonderful stuff. I had to get it out. All of it went. And uh, similarly from the other guys. So it's all in the Library of Congress. Uh, and they're sorting it. As they like to say in those British movies, we'll sort it. <laughs> they're sorting it. It reminds me of the Indiana Jones movie where they're going into this big thing with the very end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. And right. somewhere is a huge crate and fire sign theater. And yeah. David it's a little more, I think it's a little more like the end of Citizen Kane, actually. <laughs> there you go. Now, you also, you, you did some solo work, of course. You did a solo album, How Time Flies, mm -hmm. right? Based on the mark time astronaut character that was created. Yes, we, that that had come that had come about um well we each had this opportunity uh phil and peter first to do their comedy album which was called tv or not tv very <laughs> interesting uh, i futurist idea of two guys doing all their 
homemade video production. Well, you know, it only took 20 years for that to be common, right? <laughs> and then and then the audio pirates coming in and uh, and, and trying to influence what, what these two guys were doing. Interesting idea. Uh, Austin also worked on one that's even more complicated, which really involved moving be between the channels of television so the characters could move from one show to another, which in fact they really do in real life, but, you know. And uh, mine was, I, what I wanted to do was to create a, uh, a medium that you could tell g genre stories, science fiction perfect, that were complicated, deep, deep, complicated production, star names, if possible. Uh, and this, and that was, this was the pilot. I've done a hundred pilots in my life. <laughs> you know, this was the pilot idea for that, for, uh, 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 and it, it worked very well. It really did. Steve Gilmore was my, produ my producer on it. Uh, cause I had always been really behind the mic. I needed somebody in front and Steve had done the Martian space party for us, uh, in 72. Um, and that, that really is a, like, talk about the Beatles. That's just a classic performance. So it was great to have this opportunity, you know, mm -hmm. and, and really it was meant to be, to pass on as it has now passed on to creative uh, genre artists, particularly once again in science fiction, so, to some extent in mystery, but that's so repetitive that, you know, I'm less interested in it. Um, I, and, but it could have been on LPs. That was the sure. idea. You could take it home and play it. And, you know, there's always a complication about turning it over and how do you get to the other side through the middle one. And, uh, uh, well, I, I owe you a, a bit, too, because that's another connection that we have. I have right here on my wall, if you can't see behind my camera, is a Mark Time Award. I have a, a silver Mark Time Award from some years ago, 2013, I think. Yes. That's why I remembered your name. There you yeah, as Jack Ward. Yes. Um, the, it, it, then we instituted that, and it lasted for 20 years, really. Right. Once again, an interim medium the the now we're into the podcast and it's an entirely different world sure. uh we were trying to keep it alive and yeah. i think we did you know i think we it's certainly awesome. helped keep it alive and you know the influence that we have not was we had a very strong influence over people who were going into production who were interested in the engineering or the production side and i think that changed as many creative minds as anything else it wasn't so much, I want to do that as a writer or as an actor. Yes, that was true too, but it was, I want to make sound, I want to make it sound like that. And a lot of people went in, into uh, production. Of course, they're all retired now, but they then passed that on to, to the ears of the next generation. And that was the important thing is our, our I think, passing our ears along. Uh, this is, we hear things in this very complicated way. We're really, it's John Cage mixed with, you know, mixed with Fibber McGee and Molly. It's, it, there's a lot going on here. And it, 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 and when, when we came back in, in 98 uh, and did the last three albums, which are as good as the first three, three albums, and maybe in some ways better, um, Give Me Immortality or Give Me Death, 1998, which was the Millennium album, right. uh, guys on the radio, just the clock is ticking down toward the Millennium. And uh, Boom Dot Bust, which takes place, the only of our albums which takes place in the middle of the country, where everything is crossing, uh, as it always does in, in the United States. Everything everything happens in, in places you never want to be. And uh, <laughs> true enough. And uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Doctor Firesign, what was the name of that album? Uh, the Bride of Firesign. The Bride of Firesign. That's it, of course. Uh, Bride of Firesign, which brings our characters back. Many of our favorite for a last bow, really. And I and did we do that consciously? Pretty much in two thousand. That was two thousand uh, and one. And and then we did live shows from then on. We did very simple stand up front of microphones, 
uh, reading our work, but all, but changing it, uh, you know, having fun with it, ad libbing through it, all of that uh, in in the latter years before Peter died, and so we had three, we had like three years, two thousand eight, nine, ten of really good live performances. They're all recorded. It's like we have, it's like Dylan's basement tapes or it, it's, or, uh, you know, the Grateful Dead thousands of performances. There's a huge archive of material beyond those Columbia records and way beyond the first four Columbia records. For sure. And I'm glad you brought up Peter. He passed in 2012, I think, mm -hmm. with complications to leukemia. Um, can, can can you what what are your thoughts now as it's been 10 years without Peter Bergman um what what are your memories of him if you if you wanted to sort of give a bit of an idea for people how what your relationship was like with Peter we each of us had a very different relationship with Peter uh I, mine I like to think of it as the radio free Oz relationship uh, at, at, is he, Peter moved up to Whidbey Island, where, where we live, uh, for a couple of years. Two winters, he said. He'd been here for two winters. That was, he was, uh, uh, he was definitely a, a, a Washington guy. But anyway, Peter was up here, and we did uh, the first possible podcast. This is eight, eight nine something like that. And every, for, starting on... Um, on uh, Earth Day, I think it was, we did a show. He did a show every day, wow. podcast every day. Went to a studio in the woods up here, and uh, he he had the piece written, and I came in and was the foil. I always felt myself to be Peter's foil. I would go anywhere and do anything with Peter to be his foil because he needed that. It was completely different than Proctor. Oh, interesting. Uh, Proctor and Bergman were another combination, you know. Austin and Bergman, another combination. Uh, and, and, and Peter was the, um, the hub of the wheel, really. Uh, once he was gone, we knew we could never do anything again. You know, we did one last show with the three of us as a tribute. But it was, that was it. Without Peter needless to say without Phil Austin but you know when Peter was gone that was just the last we could do uh it, it was a four-man group this is it you know yeah. and we never changed <clears throat> we never changed uh, uh we never had anybody else we had people work with us but never traded any of us for you know somebody else um so it was, it was great affection he was a very I won't say difficult he was uh, he was in two places at once. Peter always had something else he was doing, had to have something else that he was doing. Um, he was he, so, so he he was always uh, drawn in two places, drawn, you know. Um, but when you had his attention, he, he there was nobody closer. You know, I considered him my closest friend, uh, partly because we worked so well together in this particular kind of team where mm -hmm. I would be his foil. I would be the guy, he'd be the lead, I'd be the guy. So, it's a very comfortable situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, it was, he died altogether too soon, too young, and really didn't have to. He could have taken care of his symptoms, his leukemia symptoms earlier than he did. Uh, his life wasn't going well. It wasn't going the way it should have. Peter should have been uh, enormously famous right. beyond the Fireside Theater. For sure. Uh, and and uh, when, he, when he returned to L.A. and was producing in L.A., it was like, you know, it's, it's just, you can't, it's a horrible city, and you really can't get anything unless you somehow can survive this right. Los Angeles, Hollywood. Why then you just become another, you know, 75 year old Jewish producer, right. a lot of, them, yeah. right. you know, and, and he was sinking and it was just tragic, tragic. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm know? sorry for your loss too. Yes, I, I thank know that you. Yeah, thank you. It's also, you yeah. know, and, and, and I we lost Phil 
Austin as well um, in 2015 from cancer, if I remember correctly. Right. And and what what thoughts do you have about your relationship with him? With the four of you, I'm sure you all had individualized connections. Oh yes, I I think probably uh, a Phil Pro, a Phil Austin had the most individual <clears throat> had the most individually separate life because. Uh, I, I had I had moved out of Hollywood to Santa Barbara, really. But Phil really had uh, roots up here. His wife is from uh, uh, from Tacoma. They had a place up here that was a family house uh, on the Sound, and he just loved it up here. And would, and Phil Phil and Una spent a huge amount of time uh, uh, camping, uh, just with themselves and their dogs. That was. He really loved that, and it would. And the 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 problem with Phil, I would say, with the problem with Phil is that he didn't fly, and so it was very hard to arrange anything like a tour or anything. Any well, right from the very beginning. I mean, I'm back from the '70s, so that that was prob that was problematic. What do I think? I think Phil was the best writer of the four of us. Um. He 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 really his sh book of short stories is really quite amazing, you know. I I managed to to write two novels, but I mean you know it it was it was when he after he passed and we got his work to send on to the library. Uh, I realized that he and I had both gotten rejection slips from the New Yorker. There was his rejection slip oh, from no. the New Yorker. You know, it was like we were living very much parallel lives as writers during the time that we weren't working together as, as Firesign Theater. Much of that, much of that time that Firesign Theater wasn't working, I was working with Phil Proctor as an actor doing various, you know, radio theater pieces, audio. And, uh, and of course that long stretch with Peter. Right, right. So our last member, we can't forget him. He's still with us, thankfully, right? Thank you. Mr. Mr. Proctor, uh, Phil Proctor, wh what's your relationship with Phil and how is it today? It's absolutely great. I talk to Phil uh, all the time. Um, we're I've already cast him in two important roles in our next production, and uh, yeah, well, I've worked with we've worked with Phil from the very beginning uh, uh, from the the uh, the War of the Worlds. He was in the War of the Worlds with with us in San Francisco. I would always cast him. He is he's a wonderful voice artist, and has been a, and, and we worked with him. My gosh, we worked in Florida endlessly. In Florida, we did four performances of ten different plays. I mean, he was at the Mystery Festival in uh, in Florida. I worked with him a huge amount as a fellow actor. Trust him completely as 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 a performer as a professional and he's working to this day in uh, all the time at wow. 83 whatever he wow. is now in hollywood he's we he works all the time and uh, great admiration for him we're, i would say we're you know we're still friends you know? <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh it's the first guy i think of really when we think about casting parts what's for phil Mm -hmm. You you left for a bit. You started to work uh, for uh, uh, in in Washington D.C. Right, taking a job with the NPR there as a producer. Um, what was that experience like? Did that help you in your understanding of either writing or producing radio? Mm, let's wind that back. That's like eighty two, right? I guess. Yes. It's, what yeah, happened yeah. really was that uh, that Firesign uh, had our audience had aged out. Essentially, the people who were buying us in the 70s were now, it, it was now the 80s. They were doing other things. The whole medium was kind of fading. The LP medium was fading. Po uh, uh, the popular music scene was no longer classic rock and roll. Things had really changed uh, as, as far as the that was concerned. Uh, in 79, 80, we did three huge shows at the Roxy, right? You know, biggest rock venue on Sunset Boulevard, huge shows, uh, two and two a night, you know, of two two hours of big big shows, all original material, you know, a huge thing. We did a television pilot, we did a this, we did a radio thing, we did a that, we did we did everything. Nobody nobody was buying us, 
And I, this job at NPR came up. Right. And I said, look, I hate to do this, but since we have nothing to keep us busy and, and have earn a living, I'm going to go to uh, Washington and check in on this job. So what they wanted me to be was the executive producer of a five hour weekly arts magazine program. Oh, wow. It was it, 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 it was not something they should have undertaken. They were wrong. Um, they I could not possibly executive produce it because I didn't know how to executive produce it. I it, I didn't even want to produce it. I wanted to host it. I wanted to program it and host it. And so I ended it up in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the old NPR offices where in the FCC building. And it was, um, it, can you imagine this getting crap five hours live? I mean, the like all things considered, well, morning, they had done, they had done ATC and ATC was a huge success. And a year before this, they'd done morning edition and morning edition was locked in and all the stations had it was, this was their idea to have to do it for the arts, see, on Sunday. What they didn't know is that all local stations program local people on Sunday. Right. You take their hours and you've lifted them away from the community. They were wrong about that. Uh, and by, I think we had 36 stations by the time it, uh, of the 50 that you had to have, you know. Um, and, and I had to produce the show so that it was two hours and three hours. And the two hours could run first or the three hours could run first. No cross promotion, no, uh, no way to take a thematic approach to the damn thing. Oh, it was so just possible. Well, yeah. I, I, I finally got a wonderful woman, Deborah Jane Lamberton, to be my producer. And Deborah Jane knew everything and, and how to do everything. Uh, and and knew everybody in the business because she'd be working at NPR for years before that. So together we managed to figure out how to do this program, and we had a huge whiteboard and it's all lined out, and we have you know all of the segments of the program just to show you how popular it was around NPR. The vice president in charge of programming walked in, took one look at this, and said, "Death wish," and walked out. So, oh my yeah, oh my yeah. So it was. So it was. Um, we finally got it on on the air. We did a two-hour pilot, a three-hour pilot, God, pilots, and finally it was on the air for five hours. Um, about half pre-recorded, but we're talking totally analog days. Everything is on tape. Right. Uh, is it tape stretches? You have to go in and do another thing because you got two more seconds on the tape than you had when you know. Yeah. Um, but it, but we we figured out between the two of us we figured out how to do this. If we'd gone if we went to the six download stations and did a program from San Francisco, Chicago, New York, uh, Washington, and wherever the other one was, it, once every six weeks. Then we'd have a traveling show and that would be cool. And if we covered all the local festivals, why we went down to Charleston. We were in Charleston for three days at the Spoleto Festival, came back, edited for a day, and bang, we were on the air wow. the next day. So this was real, I was getting in the rhythm of this thing. And then it was, then it was a thematic show, 1932. We, the interviews were getting more and more interesting. Uh, we had live, what they wanted was a concert show. Right. So we still had performance, uh, but what they really wanted was just five hours of Beethoven sonatas, really, and mm -hmm. and and but nobody wanted that except no. NPR. I thought that would be what yeah. they wanted. So oh, I did twenty six five hour shows. The last one uh, was to celebrate John Cage's seventieth birthday, oh, wow. and we commissioned a piece from. John Cage, and we were very careful to explain to our audience that this might be a little experimental on their ears, but we but we we're going to celebrate his birthday. Great, great living American composer at that moment. And his idea was so brilliant, which was to go to these uplink stations. See, we could take five up and one down there before before digital, before anything, five up, one down. 
And so each one of these stations was programmed to go in your mu music library, go like three feet up and four inches over, pull out that record and put it on the turntable. And so what we ended up with was this glorious mix of everything that public radio had to offer. Drama, spoken word, classical, pop, folk, everything came up and he'd fade down and fade up and fade up. And those kind of John Cage's Orphic statements would go over this. And, and it was fabulous. It was fabulous. And uh, we, and it was, it was uh, completely unique. Nobody had ever done anything like this before. Okay. And so um, I was called, got called into the, uh, the program director's office. He, he fired me. And I was to have my office cleaned out by Monday, uh, on Monday, which was Memorial Day. <laughs> and that was that was my experience. A little it, apropos there. It's yeah. interesting that you mentioned, you know, this this lovely producer that and, and her name was again, sorry, Dorothy. Deborah Jane. Sorry, Deborah Jane. Okay. Deborah sorry, Jane I'm still, Yeah, my but names have never been my my forte. But it, you women have have been a great part of your life when it comes to your creative work. Your first wife, Tiny, had a had a role in one of your shows. And then, of course, now your wife, your current wife, uh, or your second wife, Judith, uh, is has created other world media productions with you. And you guys are still deeply involved in so much new material that I'm jealous. And, uh, and <laughs> I'm excited to hear what's coming up. We're going to have another interview uh, on that when you guys start produce, uh, sending some stuff out specifically. Can, can you talk a little bit about um, that aspect of collaboration? Because it seems to me that that's been a hallmark of, of your career. Well, collaboration is, that's really the way I, I, I used to, I, I guess at the beginning of the Feinstein Theater, I was identified pretty much as a poet. Oh, he's the poet in the group. And that's a, that is as my first book, The Sullen Art, it is a solitary art poetry, pretty much. But creatively, right from high school onward as a writer, I've always loved the, the collaboration. I was very fortunate in uh, when, when I first worked at uh, KPFK, to the only woman who was on the air as an announcer in Los Angeles at that time is a woman named Janie Bennett. And, and she had this perfect cello voice, played the cello and had this cello voice, really beautiful. And we did a lot of productions together. Uh, and then she, then she went on and didn't stay in public radio, architectural historian. And Deborah Jane stayed on after the Sunday show. Uh, Deborah Jane stayed on and broadcast, produced and broadcast almost every broadcast from the Kennedy Center. Her, she did everything. I mean, it was amazing her career in public radio. She retired a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, but she knew wa she knew Washington in that way or NPR in that way. If you never lived in Washington D.C. or you know, it's weirdness. And uh, and remember, this is 1980. There's the middle of the whoever's awful administration it was. Um, I'm sure it's not weird anymore. No, no sorry. No, much less. <laughs> it's and then, and then weird, yeah. Judith, uh, we've, we've been a couple for 35 years now. Uh, yes, Tiny definitely. I, would, I should acknowledge Tiny for sure um, that she was in albums. She was uh, a producer of live shows. She was very much involved in the early uh, part of the Firesang Theater. And then uh, Judith has had her other world media long before even I met her. Wow. So it was her company that she had started uh, in her in her 20s, really, like three years before, something like that. That's and amazing. it produced any number of programs. When we met, she was an already an accomplished producer uh, working for NPR and uh, and and. Uh, uh, at uh, WGBH and do it. And oh, there, there were there were places you could work in those days, you know, <laughs> there were shows that you could produce segments for. It was sure. a different kind of time. Right. But um, uh, and now I'm collaborating with my son Orson. Awesome. So yeah, and that's that has really proved to be a wonderful thing. Indeed, it has.
Isn't it great when you can share those kind of things? Now, speaking of sharing, it's time for me to bring in Richard, who's been waiting very patiently and smoking his pipe and making me feel very comfortable just watching all that. Richard, <laughs> you you guys shared a, 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 a friendship with Judith uh, without even knowing it, I guess. I, I'd heard in previous conversation here that you knew her uh, before. Uh, yes, uh, Judith was in my high school in Milburn, New Jersey. She was a couple of years behind me, and I, I didn't actually know her that well in high school. She does a, her picture appears in my yearbook, and uh, I knew her older brother uh, Mark uh, a little better. He was a year ahead, uh, but this was a a, a complete surprise uh, that David uh, and I discovered this one evening at the old Midwest Radio Theater workshop, and we were just having drinks and talking, and and uh, uh, David. Uh, Said, where where were you born and i told him and he said well i was just there arranging to get married and you know thud thud jaws hit the <laughs> hit the table <laughs> and uh it's just an odd coincidence judith is is quite wonderful as i say, i didn't know her particularly in in high school but she had gone on into radio and i um well i had not directly um let me let me put in a quick parenthesis before I continue, David. Parenthesis. Uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, a combination between John Cage and Fibber McGee and Molly, and it occurs to me that the uh, hall closet routine might have been a John Cage sonata. <laughs> <laughs> and parenthesis. <laughs> uh, yeah, very good. Right, that's that's. Absolutely right. And we met we met Fibber McGee at the Midwest Radio Theater Workshop. Jim Jordan. Yes. Jim That's Jordan. Right. He was the very first one. Yeah. That's fantastic. Very nice man. His his brain was perfectly clear. His body was beginning to go back on him at age 85. Uh, but he actually came out and said a few words at our show that year. So technically, we can say that David and I can say that we were once on the radio with Fibber McGee. That's uh, incredible. You know, the and, funny thing is, I got to interrupt you one more time, and then it's all yours, Rich, is that I'm yeah. older I'm older than Jim Jordan was then, now. How did that doing, happen? Well, you're doing better than he was, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, talk well, to this man. If I'm not the luckiest Fire Sign Theater fan in the world, I'm in the running for that. Uh, <laughs> See, I was not a radio kid. David and the Firesign guys all grew up in the radio era, and I didn't. We had television in the house before I was born, and uh, that's what I grew up with. I did not discover radio theater until I was in college. Well, I did hear, uh, at age 12, I did hear the first family, Vaughn Meter's album, which was essentially a radio theater LP, sketch <coughs> comedy. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, that was impressive, but it didn't stick with me. It was Firesign Theater that did it for me. I, I after high school, I went to the University of Virginia for a couple of years, and my second year there, I was uh, living in a crummy apartment off campus. And uh, let me parenthesize again: I had done some acting in high school, acting in music, so I was a performer. And I had done some stage and so on. And when I got into college, I volunteered at the student radio station, WUVA, WUVA, wonderful WUVA. And there was a DJ. That was a top 20 tight format station, very, very 60s. Uh, well, somebody brought over this LP to our apartment one day and said, you got to hear this. And I thought it was another band. See, you were just talking about yourself, how you, how the Clare Sane was really a rock band. And that's that's what I kind of expected at first, because here I was a DJ on the radio. And it was waiting for the electrician. And uh, three minutes and 45 seconds into side one, I had, I guess you have to call it an epiphany. It was a bit like Buddha sitting under the tree. The light streams down, and it's like, this is what I want to do with my life. Wow. Uh, up to then, I really did. <laughs> Oh, How old were you but, at that point? Oh, uh, this was uh, the, uh, I, I would have been uh, 18. Okay. Uh, this would have been the uh, fall of 1969. Wow. 
Wow. Okay. And um, and incidentally, again, uh, when David and the Fire Signs were working on that album, the summer of '67, I was in the Haight Ashbury in San Francisco. That was the summer of love. Right. But uh, I was really only there for a few days, and the only clothing I had to wear was my Eagle Scout uniform. <laughs> you fit in perfectly, I can just imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I had been at the popular, world. I would think it would make him actually quite, uh, quite, quite yeah. the, uh, quite the show star. There were sure. five hundred of us. We had been at the World Jamboree in Idaho, and for some unexplained reason, they flew us to San Francisco on our way home for a few days. And uh, so I spent, so I was there in the Hashbury, you know, and it was the summer uniform, too, with the knee socks and the garter tabs and the shorts, <laughs> and the smoking a bear hat, you know. I think your scout a, leader ran out of weed, and he was just looking for a quick way to get some. <laughs> Just not me. our scout leader oh sorry sorry I, uh, <laughs> we, uh, no in my general i never saw any uh, weed in high school it was just not there at all it didn't happen go. until i got to college uh go. but uh i it had happened by the time i heard waiting for the electrician i'll tell you that right now and, and <laughs> boy it was amazing wow. So uh, i uh, decided that i wanted to study this field and get a degree in broadcasting or telecommunication, whatever, wow. I transferred ultimately to Indiana University here in Bloomington because they had a radio slash TV program and a degree offered. And uh, that turned out to be academically pretty worthless. Uh, uh, but I met such wonderful people here that I never left. I, I still live in Bloomington. And uh, about and started to try and do radio stuff. When I got here, another coincidence, one of my professors here at IU was Robert Leroy Bannerman, who had written the biography of Norman Corwin. He was Corwin's biographer. And R Bannerman was uh, hugely into radio theater, and he turned us on to the old time radio shows in classes. He would turn out the lights and play things. Uh, Three Skeleton Key with uh, Vincent Price scared the bejesus out of us. And, and one of the uh, best, played, for sure. Yes, he played us Norman Corwin's On a Note of Triumph, which just blows you away even today. An incredible right. program. Uh, and he, in fact, brought Norman to uh, Bloomington in 1975 to give a lecture at Ernie Pyle Hall, the journalism school. And I went to the lecture and, and came down afterwards and was introduced to Norman. I had two minutes with him and shook his hand, and that was it. And I'm, uh, I, I don't know if he ever remembered that. I never forgot it, but I don't know if he remembered it. Uh, but uh, I got very lucky so many times. One of them was about 10 years after I came to Bloomington, uh, KOPM, the community radio station in Columbia, Missouri, started the Midwest Radio Theater Workshop as an experiment originally. And I got word of this and they said, uh, Fibber McGee is going to be there and two members of the Fireside Theater are going to come. Well, I've got to go, oh boy. So I went wide-eyed as a participant or student and there was David, and Peter Bergman was there as well. And I, it, it, at this point, these were the gods in heaven. It's, you know, gee, can, can I touch you? Oh, wow. You know, <laughs> it was very awe-inspiring to, to, to meet these people. The workshop brought a lot of really good professionals to work with the students and participants. It was a wonderful event. Uh, its successor is still around after all these years. And uh, I, I was so charged up by that first one. In, uh, it was in May of 1980 is when the first one was. And I came back to Bloomington, emptied my savings account of the entire $250 <laughs> and put on a show, uh, a live show here in Bloomington. 
I had at that time, uh, I had a recording studio. Uh, I will mention that after college, I had gone into business by building a recording studio and I had started a record label and so forth. Bloomington has a tremendous music scene. Uh, the local uh, IU College of Music is one of the best in the world. And over the years, the place has silted up with often a large amount of talent. Uh, so I was in the recording studio scene. Uh, and I'd been a musician myself, but kind of stepped back from performing when I went on the other side of the glass, you know, to become an engineer. Well, I came back every year to this workshop. And so did David. Uh, Peter did not come back after the first year or two, uh, but David was there every year. And we got to know each other and began to work together and did several things um, uh, together. In, uh, and, and the workshop continued every year. It was a week-long event, and it, it was totally insane. Uh, I, I, we are hoping that this will now revive. There are serious prospects of this. Uh, uh, another long story to, for another day in another interview. But <laughs> I might toss in, to, toss in that Judith was the producer of the 10th anniversary uh, MRTW broadcast. Wow. Yes. Which, yes. Featured, uh, uh, which featured Norman Corwin's uh, The Odyssey of Runyon Jones, oh, which wow. I directed with uh, like this great eight-year-old kid right he was this fabulous yeah. local kid it's a beautiful production and and at that point norman came back and we asked him to talk he, you know he phoned in he did a phone mm -hmm. with us but uh that was the first time i have to compliment my wife the first time that the mrtw had won an award <laughs> that's right For all of that's the words right. like you never get the prize you know you, you, you right. gotta 10 years into it, and then finally you get a prize. So, congratulations. I can hear her laughing in the background. Congratulations to you. That's wonderful. Yeah. Nickel will not get you the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> well, that was a terrific show. There were four very, very good plays. Yeah. And the, 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 the workshop really had a high standard. It was a week of, of classes and workshops and seminars. But then in, uh, we always put together a live two hour show for the final night, which was crazy amount of work. Uh, and you'd come back from this exhausted, but with your batteries recharged. That's, you know, what happened to me every year. Uh, it was uh, the, the uh, Odyssey of Runyon Jones. There's a little backstory on that. I advanced from student to staff member to, to, to teacher right. to uh, uh, producer of the show by 1987. And uh, for the 1980, and, and I had a habit of, they'd give me the scripts and the directors would be assigned ahead of time. And then casting and everything else started after we got to, to the workshop. And when I got the scripts in, I would go through my own collection of old time radio shows and send the director a cassette of something similar, saying, okay, you're doing a detective show. Here's, here's an old detective show. Maybe it'll give you an idea. Well, in 88, David was directing a play called Heaven as Usual. And the conceit was that the universe was a giant bureaucracy. I think the first opening scene of that play, you hear a phone ring and a woman picks it up and says, God's office. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so I looked through my collection, and the nearest thing I could find was the Odyssey of Runyon Jones. Uh, and so I sent David a cassette of that, and about three days later, he called me back and he said, oh my God, this cassette brought back a lot of memories. Apparently, that was the play that inspired David as a what, eight-year-old boy or 10-year-old no, boy? No, I was in jun junior high school. I was probably 14. 14. To, to, Just to the age. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I got a book of dog stories. And in this book of dog stories, about four in, was the script to Runyon Jones. 
I had anybody ever had I ever seen a radio script before? Wow. No. Had a famous writer of this radio script ever told me how to act and how to produce this script? Well, it's all in there in the script. Norman wrote all of these notes. It's all there. And that that for, that that was the beginning. That was the beginning. And to so to finally get to produce that was pretty big point for me. Yeah. And the odd, the odd circular logic is that I have managed to reconnect David with the same kind of experience that his work with Firesign had given me. And, uh, you know, that was quite wonderful. Yes, and of course, we did Runyon Jones that next year in 89. Uh, and uh, then that year in 89, I had been given a book of Corwin scripts. He published a couple of books of his scripts, and I had been given one of those that a friend of mine had found in a used bookstore. And I brought it to the workshop, and we were sitting around late night over drinks. We kind of did that a lot at the workshop. That was very popular. And um, I was leafing through the book, and I came across a script uh, the date of which, and I what what I noticed was the date. I said, "Hey, look at this. Here's one of Corwin's scripts. It's going to be 50 years old in two years. Maybe we could do it at the workshop." Well, I didn't know the script at the time. It was "We Hold These Truths." It was the show Norman had done in 1941 for the uh, the 150th birthday of the Bill of Rights at right. President Roosevelt's behest. And a uh, long story, everyone thought that might be a very good idea, but quickly it, it matured into something that went beyond the workshop, that it needed to be a, a, a real, real production. And various people started jumping in and trying to work on it. I think Mike Packer from Grand Rapids started trying to get a grant for it, and he I don't know how many grant applications he put in, 50 or 60 or whatever it was, and they all were rejected because the subject matter was, quote, too controversial, end quotation. And finally, Judith and Mary Beth Kirshner somehow passed a miracle, which has never, never had happened before and to this day, I don't know if it ever has again, they got the Pew Charitable Trusts to take a rejected application out of the wastebasket, wow. put it back on the desk, and fund it. Wow. And for a new production of We Hold These Truths for the 200th anniversary of the day the Bill of Rights became law, which was coming up in 1991. And See, uh, I, I saw a picture. I saw Judith earlier before the interview, and I never saw her wings. So I'm I'm stunned <laughs> at how amazing this lady is. That's fantastic. Oh yes. I, uh, Let me jump in just for a second here and say that this was is it really a saga. Yeah. I wrote I wrote ten thousand words on this for a scholarly publication on wow. on norman everything else is like scholar writing you know and mine is like this memoir it, with a lot of it it, it really it was a saga it, it, richard was there at the throughout but very particularly at the very end we right. had to produce this show out of an hour and a half's worth of recording an hour show that was going to go worldwide all network, Every, right. all network at noon all bang commercial, bang all public all commercial all public and of course around the world and the you AFR know a, and the af satellite feed so oh, yeah, this is so, the internet satellite feed yeah. yes so it all had to go up on tape right. via satellite sure we we recorded it the voice tracks one weekend right because we had 50 some actors Okay, they were all Hollywood. They were all basically Hollywood artists of one kind or another. Television people mostly. They were major stars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, and they were major stars. Really good. Yeah, they were major. <laughs> to get it all. And together, uh, yeah. uh, Ed, Ed Asner and and I mean with James uh, Earl Jones. Yeah, James Earl Jones. He was the big headliner, right? Oh wow! Uh, yeah. Reading the First Amendment, I, I believe. Norman Lear. Oh, he did the Orson Welles part from 1941. The the actor. 
right? So, so there were two days of recording, and then there was a very complex. We had an orchestra, a score, so that had to be done like a movie, and then uh, you know all of the post. It wasn't a, it wasn't huge, but there was enough post to, you know. But when we got this all together, we were what uh, an uh, an hour and twenty four three minutes or something. We were twelve minutes too long. We we yeah. Just, was we, it only that twelve minutes? Yeah. I remember this very well because I, you, uh, you tell the story, Rich. From here on. Okay, okay. Uh, I was uh, around some after the workshop that year in in ninety one. Uh, we I went home and David called and he said, Richard, would you like to come out and help us produce this? We hold these truth program, and I said, absolutely. I wonderful. I I'm there. How much will it cost me? <laughs> I was never really good on negotiation. He said, no, 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 we'll pay you. They flew me to Hollywood and put me up in a Hilton. Uh, and uh, David and I would would uh, travel to the studio every day from the hotel. And David gave me the wonderful tour of Hollywood. It was this was for me. The kid goes to Hollywood. You know, it yeah. was it was incredible because here's all these stars. My job was associate producer, and in Hollywood they spell that associate producer, but they don't pronounce it that way. They pronounce it as if it was spelled G O F E R, which is what I really was—a gopher. You know, I was a blur with a clipboard. Uh, I was detailed to meet everyone as they came into the studio and get them to sign their papers and tell them where they should be and everything. You know. Uh, I have so many memories. Uh, the very first day, sa Saturday morning, we started a 30 Saturday morning uh, with uh, people arriving and it was Ed Asner was the first one opened the door and there he was and he was Lou Grant at yeah. that moment. It was like, yeah. there's Lou yeah. Grant because he's like, it's Shabbos and I've got to work, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, he, he, by the way, had a wonderful time. He ended up staying all day and schmoozing with people he hadn't seen in a while. Had a nice. had a wonderful time. But I got to meet these people. And uh, Entertainment Tonight came in to do a, a piece on it, and we were tripping over their cables and so on. Uh, and we recorded all these, uh, almost all the voices. There were a few that were recorded later uh, that I had more to do with. Fess Parker and uh, John Ireland and uh, Esther Roll came in uh, late. Uh, she came in t during our post-production and I went up to Santa Barbara to get the others. Uh, but uh, and, and incidentally, uh, when I went to Santa Barbara to get Fess Parker and John Ireland, Deborah Jane Lamberton was my engineer. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and only only now have I learned more about her background and how incredibly <laughs> experienced she really was. So um, that was a beginning of a of a huge relationship with Norman. I'm I'm just so aware of your time. You guys are so generous with it, and I would love I I with this to me. We're just scratching the surface. I have to have you back again individually and and talk more about all the stuff. Me, you look let so me let me summarize a little bit. Yeah, then. let me let me summarize. Uh, that program woke up NPR to Norman Corwin, that he was still around and he was doing things. And they started broadcasting some of his older programs uh, and uh, eventually gave him a contract to do six new shows for NPR, which were quite wonderful. I mean, Norman was in his 80s. He was 81 when we did the Bill of Rights show. Wow. And uh, very, very active and, and spry and, and all of that. By the time we finished that production uh, of We Hold These Truths, we were on a hugging basis. We hugged each other goodbye. You know, uh, nice. I remember that. And uh, when the NPR started broadcasting his other shows, I, by this time, had a studio and a business going here in Bloomington. And I got the call to do the fulfillment on the shows to make cassette copies, as it was back then, and CDs in some cases, to you know call the 800 number and get a copy of the show. And uh, so I developed a continuing relationship with Norman when he did his new shows. My company 
published them. We we put them on recordings and, and packaged them and artwork and everything and put them out. And I developed a um, mail order catalog for selling mostly new audio theater. The only OTR stuff we had was Corwin's. And we had Firesign in there as well and so forth. That came out of the Firesign uh, when Firesign got back together in the 90s, they reformed and had a hugely successful 25th anniversary performance at the Paramount in Seattle, which led immediately to a national tour. And I was asked to merchandise that tour. Uh, they only they only controlled two of their products at that moment, anything you want to and everything you know is wrong. So I sold anything and everything. That was 93, uh, right? 1993, 93, 94, 93, 94. Is what I think the tour was. Yeah. Right. And uh, that the, the, the flyer I put out for that became a, a, a catalog. And Very cool. I ended up having this wonderful relationship with Norman throughout the years, and we exchanged phone calls. He would, the phone would ring, Richard, it's Norman. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> who am I? My God. Uh, we had a wonderful time, and we had many emails back and forth. I could write anything in an email, and he'd get it. Any reference, any joke, nice. and he'd get it. It was wonderful. But the same, the same is true, of course, with David and the Firesign guys. Uh, and uh, then in nineteen, in two thousand one, about a month after nine eleven, uh, we had all been shocked, and everyone was like blown away by the horrible tragedy in New York. Yeah. Norman called, and he said, "There's a program I did back in nineteen forty one." that I think needs to be heard today. But I've reviewed it, and it wouldn't work for a modern audience. The cultural references are outdated. The basic uh, tenor of it is too folksy. Uh, Richard, could you help me update this? Well, when I remembered how to breathe and, and got off the floor, I said yes. As I don't know that Norman has ever collaborated with anyone else on his own scripts. He was a he was a solo writer. Uh, but he asked me to collaborate with him. Long story short, it took uh, it took us quite a long time to get this done. When I uh, cut out everything that we had to cut out, we were down to about fifteen minutes. It's a half it had been a half hour show, or half of it had to go. Mm -hmm. So we had to ha have new material and a different idea and so forth. And we worked back and forth on this script for nine years. Uh, it, the process was interrupted a couple of times when Norman had medical emergencies. He fell a couple of times, had to have brain surgery once and so forth. But finally, in 2010, we got a script that Norman signed off on and liked and gave me the rights to produce it and distribute it any way I like. Uh, and we were talking about getting a production together. He wanted Tom uh, Hanks to come in and be the principal voice and so on and so forth, because he was always used to working with major stars. Right. Well, then he died. Uh, he passed on in 2011 at the age of 101. Unexpectedly. <laughs> and it, and it was. His older brother had lived to be 108, and their father lived to be like 112 or something like that. So we thought he was going to be around a little while longer, but he went. And I was not able to get a production of this script done the way it needed to be done. I didn't have the resources. And so I sat on it for another decade. Finally, in 2021, the National Audio Theater Festivals, which is the descendant and modern uh, version of the old Midwest Radio Theater Workshop. And we and should AT talk about that in a, in a whole different conversation, because that's a massive conversation as well, the NATF, for sure. Oh, yes, it is. It's, it's quite wonderful. NATF.org, they need your help, folks. For sure. Um, but um, they asked me if I would do this as a production. It was covid 
time and their annual event was going to be online, uh, you know, Zooming like we are now. Uh, but they wanted this as a production, so they came up with some funding and uh, I put it together. Because it was COVID, we could not bring the actors together in a studio, as Norman and I had always thought would happen. Uh, we had to record every actor individually. Some of them were recorded here in Bloomington one at a time, and others were recorded elsewhere uh, on Zoom or in their own studios or, or whatever. But an awful lot of wonderful people came on board to help with this. Phil Proctor indeed came on board. And as you know, David ended up being the principal voice, the quote, American, end quote. No one in this cast, it's a cast of 17 people, including David, and none of them have names. And we, uh, the point of most of them is where they come from, not who they are. They're just Americans. And one of the things that happened along in the production, there are several moments in the script where the group has to react as a group. Now, Norman and I had planned that we would have the actors in the studio and we would direct them to give us the group reaction we were looking for. Agreement, disagreement, uh, uncertainty, whatever it was. Well, couldn't do that. Not possible. So I made a uh, producer's decision and decided to say to the actors, forget your character. Give me your personal reaction to this question or this point that is being discussed. Tell me what you think. Mm. And they did. Uh, some of them went on for several minutes. <laughs> and then I had to take those recordings, select the best bits and put them together as I put the whole thing together on a, on a digital wow. editor. Yeah. Uh, and, and a fantastic uh, job you've done and, and a fantastic part, uh, part you had as well, David, that was, I really right. was, it was a very moving, uh, I've, we've, we've already had a pre-listen in our Sunday showcase women, the actual release of this on the mutual audio network in the way that we would like it is on Monday matinee, which is on president's day which is just this That's Monday. Perfect. I have to say that I, I did not expect to be the principal voice. Even after I recorded it, I didn't expect. What I did really, don't you think, Rich, is just I just channeled Norman as best I could? You channeled Norman and you were also yourself, which is how Norman would have directed you. That's, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely that. That is how he would have directed me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, just be just be yourself. But it's 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 the cadence of the writing that is 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 Corwin and very unique. Style. As I say, I never expected to do it. I'm really proud. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm what's the old sixty? I'm stoked, man. Yeah. That, they, that they chose my 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 read for it because it's it's really a wonderful piece, and and it's a, it's one of those stories you know audio stories that you rarely get to tell. It's just it's all it's heart it's from the heart you know. That's wonderful. And the the program backstory it had been done originally as one of his twenty six by Corwin's. He created it in a week for the 4th of July weekend in 1941, at a time when the country was terribly divided, terribly polarized over the question of getting involved in World War II. Right. And uh, he wanted to, uh, people were yelling at each other and, and he wanted to lower the temperature of the rhetoric and, and concentrate on where we stood on common ground. That was his idea. And of course, as it happened, Orson Welles heard the program and liked it uh, it was Ray Collins who'd done the, the original broadcast. And Orson called Norman and said, can I do this? I want to do it my, uh, do a production myself. Norman said, sure. But Wells was involved in shooting the Magnificent Ambersons that year. And it was a, a while before his schedule and, and CBS network schedule could get together. And just by coincidence, as it happened, they scheduled this, Orson's broadcast of this, for the evening of December 7th, 
not knowing what was due to happen. And it was the first thing heard on the network that day that wasn't a news report. Wow. After the, the uh, Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. You know, and, uh, sure. So it was Norman's opening sh shot sort of for World War II. And he bookended the war with on a note of triumph on 14 August. And uh, it's an amazing coincidence. It is. And I think Norman was right in 2001 when he picked this out and said, this is something we need to hear again. And in fact, we it's even more needed today than it was in 2001. Absolutely. Because we are even we are so polarized and divided today and have been thanks to people I will not name. Thank you. <laughs> I don't need to give them any more publicity. Um, uh, and, and it is more appropriate and apposite today than it's ever been in a lot of ways. I'm amazed. I suspect Norman from up there somewhere may have seen this coming. And, and uh, uh, that's one of the reasons I couldn't get the uh, uh, resources to do it earlier. Thank you, Norman. <laughs> great timing as always. Great timing, that's great. Yeah, great timing as always, boy. Wow. This, this image of him, you know, yeah. ready to do, ready to cue, ready to cue. Yes. You know, I've just, you can learn just just from that picture, let alone from you know what he could do. Jack, Great story, need, Richard. That's so that's so good to hear that 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 story before you hear this program because um, it some things just take a long long time to do and are really hard and and we've we you know it it takes. It takes not just money, but it takes just a lot of uh, of love to be able to pull out of uh, a an archive something that is so fitting, you know. And it's and it's and it's one thing you can dig into this author and find those pieces. This, you know, it, it's like I could do and would do. Uh, Odyssey of Running Jones at the drop of a cue, you know, because it always works. It, anybody can be in it. Uh, and even obscure things like like uh, the, the rhyming thing about radio, you know, uh, it's, it's just amazing stuff just to read through because his language is so beautiful. And it's a language medium that we're in. That's the, you don't get around to language in my, in my how to write for radio until number five. You start with where you are right. and, and you start with what you hear and you mm -hmm. go on to, is there any music going on? And then you finally come down to maybe there's some words here and what are we going to do with them? You know, as I've, as I've been talking to Orson, we're talk to you more, Richard, about our forthcoming production. We have to have you here for it. Uh, oh, yeah. We'll let I'm you there. know. We'll, we'll let there. you know. Har, har, well, you har. know, back to back, uh, another comment about Norman. I have a very large collection of old-time radio shows, a great many of them, and not all of them survive. Frankly, they, do, they don't. Humor can date. Uh, attitudes change and so forth. And uh, some of them, Fibber McGee and Molly is one that does survive pretty well because they uh, relied on wordplay and, and so forth yeah. and uh, had very, very good characters. But Corwin's work, the majority of Corwin's work survives better than almost anyone else I can think of. Wow. Better than uh other people who were big at the time like arch obler yeah yeah so so much otr depends on movie stars playing roles yeah. you know it was great to hear peter Lorre actually playing something or humphrey bogart in a series you know right. but so many people who they who reproduce now do uh, is sort of amateur otr want to do those kinds of shows that are completely dependent on star talent 
Right. And 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 on indi- characters like Fibber McGee and Molly, and and not on storytelling, which radio is also very good for. You know. I must admit, David, you're right. I just two weeks ago I did the Maltese Falcon, the yeah. Lux Radio Theater version here in Indiana, and of course I did it in Bogey's voice. I was <laughs> send you, I'm sending you over, baby. You know. That's right. Uh, I I did one on Zoom in the middle of last year. Also, okay. same thing. Maltese Falcon. Fantastic. But it was know, great, but the part was great though. It was. It's, but people, uh, people wanted to hear Bogey's voice. They wanted to hear him doing that. It was that same sure. star thing you were talking about. And that's still you the know. pull in live uh, stage radio drama theater is those old time classics that are just that still people remember so clearly even so many years later. So I absolutely. think you can do I think you can do Lux Radio Theater adaptations. I, I always wanted to do Sunset Boulevard and oh. and and did that at yeah. one point when I was living in Santa Barbara because that oh. that's such a great part. And you and you and you look at the movie and maybe do some adjustments, but the Lux scripts mm, because they tell a familiar story. Mm-hmm. And are less dependent on star talent than say a mediocre suspense script that depended on Jack Benny, yeah. you know. Yeah. That and and you know down in L.A. I got there's all these guys who do who do uh, voice you do Jack Benny, who mm-hmm. especially is smoking a cigar and doing doing those Jewish comedians, right. and uh, I, and you know okay, but it's not it, it's not the real guys like Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, you know, I mean, without both of them, what have you got, you know? Well, yeah. David and I have done some of that ourselves. And one year yeah. in the workshop, he called me and said, can you do Ronald Reagan? And I said, well, I don't know, but I can ask mommy. And, uh, you know, <laughs> and he wrote this piece called the Ronald Reagan murder case. That was a very, a, a total modern script. It was not an old, old time radio thing. And uh, we had a grand time. We had a load of fun doing that. And you later turned it into a full novel, as I recall. Right. Uh, that wasn't the only voice you did either, because in, I think in the first scene of that, it's uh, around the swimming Hollywood swimming pool, and there are any number of stars. I think you played them all, Richard. I, That's amazing. The Marx you know Brothers and the Rich Brothers. And... That's do you know what you did for me? I had done some impressions up to that point. I had made radio commercials and things like that and done some impressions, but I'd always done them in my own studio with nobody there. And I do each line three or four times and edit the best takes together. I had never performed an impression in front of anyone. And (laughs) David wrote a script that had me not only doing an impression live, but doing several of them and talking to myself. (laughs) <laughs> Every time I work with you, David, w- one of the best things about it is that you always stretch me. That's awesome. Well, again and again and again. So and can, it's fabulous. Can you both just, I, there's one frustration that I have in the modern audio theater movement, and I'm, and I'm hoping you guys can speak to it a little bit. Um, a lot of people who are starting this have never listened to the old time stuff, have never listened to anything. Um, in the past and they see it as sort of like they're creating can you speak to how valuable it is to be able to listen to the stuff that's happened in the past and what you can learn from it in creating story today oh god let's start with you richard and we'll go back to david then for that Mm -hmm. that's possible Uh, it it is true the old time radio was am it was uh only five thousand hertz wide it was mono uh, and they had to learn how to tell a story in sound uh, with the, with considerable technical limitations that we don't have today. There was no way to edit. Record pre-recorded pre-recording was not uh, an option. The, the networks would not allow recordings to be pr- to be broadcast. Everything had to be done live. If you wanted music, you had to have the musicians right there in front of the microphone, ready to go. Uh, and Of course, this was before television and all the big advertising money was in radio, so they had money and they had support, but the techniques they evolved, well, there's a line in between Americans that that, uh, applies to this and some of the other things you've just said, David, 
that anything that is still true after 80 years is a pretty good bet to be true for a while longer. And today there's a huge renaissance in audio theater technique in podcasts. And the young people that are getting into it and doing it are kind of having to reinvent the wheel in many cases. And if they listen to the old stuff, they can uh, get some real help in finding out what works and what doesn't work. Sometimes you learn more from failure than from success, you know, uh, and uh, it can really jumpstart what they're doing in a lot of ways. Some of the old time radio does anything that survives and still works, like Three Skeleton Key is wonderful. Frankly, Henry Aldrich, not so much. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Three <laughs> Skeleton Key, that was from Escape, too, wasn't it? The, the Escape series? They you did know? it on Escape yeah. and they did it uh, on uh, 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 Suspense once Probably and so suspense. on. Probably Suspense, yeah, for sure. But the, yeah. but the, the uh, Vincent Price version is oh, yeah. it's the best. Uh, sure. But uh, yes. Um, and and uh, and in this, I also include uh, mo more modern work. So many people thought that radio theater died when television came in, and it was right. passe, and it was an antique thing, and so on. Not true. The art form was invented before radio on recordings. It flowered on radio, and when television came along, it went back to recordings. Right. Uh, Stan Freeberg and his wonderful singles and his sides that he cut with Dawes Butler. Sure. And uh, then later, of course, the first family and then the Fire Signs Theater, right. who, who realized they were not making a broadcast, they were making a recording. And people could hear it more than once. And that's what they wanted, as David just said. I love it. Uh, I love I love when they uh, they talk about, you know, have you moved to the other side yet? No, he's not here yet or something like that. It's just talking about even flipping sides and how you're bringing well, the audience. Let's the in. other side. Yeah. Oh, they're yeah, talking Chinese. Right. It's OK. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Right. that exactly. whole thing. It was very uh, but, difficult to get to the other side of an LP. If you, you know, once you're on one side, then what do you do? You go into the hole. This is not. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts, well, David, on your side of the things uh, of, of old time radio and, and stuff that you guys worked on? Why is it important for people to learn? Well, by this time, we're old time radio. That is to say the Firesign Theater is. Uh, in that when we entered radio as uh, as improvising comedians there had been no such thing ever before it, scripts always had to be vetted and uh, we agreed among uh, ourselves for the dear friends and let's eat show that we would not prepare really except for just say what have you got got this got that okay I'll surprise you with this and then for and then we had an engineer who would drop in uh, sound cues and background music and stuff at, at a moment's notice without letting us know so it was completely mm -hmm. improvised. So I would say, as far as old time radio goes, if you want to free your imagination beyond the goon show, which occupied the 1950s on the BBC, it's what broke through on the BBC. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the BBC original radio version. Listen to that. It was a game changer. First time most we were in MSW. I think we were at MRTW in the 80 or 81, something like that. And that show arrived and we all went into the green room and listened to the broadcast before we went on the air for our own show. It was yeah. really something, certainly Tommy Lopez and, and uh, those shows which were had sound recorded on location. This was a brand new idea. You didn't have to be locked into the studio. As far as the real OTR goes, uh, at the end, in the in the late in the latter fifties, particularly on, uh, and, and one side remark is there's too many people have written Nick Danger over and over again. The mystery genre is great for radio, but the 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 detective character has to evolve. <laughs> you know, it's got to go yeah. somewhere beyond Nick. Anyway, it's a very it's an easy form to write in. Mm -hmm. And uh, those programs toward the end got funny, uh, uh, the self-aware, 
you know, Sam self-consciously aboard Howard, that they were playing Howard Duff. themselves. Howard yeah. Duff was so wonderful at that. Yes. And um, uh, and and <clears throat> footsteps. You, it suddenly, if you were in real places, because the sound effects, the Foley artistry had gotten to be so good. What we call ring a bell, slam a door radio. This was like complicated footsteps and all that stuff that had that they had evolved by that time for so so those latter detective shows particularly and duff is uh sam spade yeah yeah particularly good to listen to as late form late old time radio production Right. how it all put together when i was teaching radio i would i would always play a fibra mcgee and, Mo and molly track and this is what happens there it's their summer vacation show it's the last show of the of the uh, season i remember that and yeah. at the end of the show was, yeah. they want to take they want to just take a little row on the lake and so they walk down the dock and they meet the old timer yeah 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 and they rent a canoe and they get in the canoe and they put the oars in the water and set sail and and fibber sings a song and the and the and the the, the gentleman the the merry whoever the they are man. the king's men yeah. come in yeah. and take over the foreground and finish the song and then it fades back into the background it is the most gorgeous piece of live radio production that I've ever heard. And I always play that example of what you can do. Yes. On a Sunday mm -hmm. afternoon. Which I borrowed yeah. for How Time Flies. Oh, that's yes. Yeah. yes. If you'll uh, that's that's, amazing. You're absolutely right. The, the, the uh, art <laughs> and science of radio developed. Uh, it's historically interesting to go back to the early days but it isn't uh, what you would put out today. It isn't, uh, you know, sure. the early stuff is yeah. uh, the again, uh, the what's happened now is that the cost of doing all this has crashed through the floor heading for the basement, you know, yes. because it, it, it used to take a whole network with all their resources to do the top level productions. Not anymore. Right. Not anymore. Anybody with a with a computer and a decent microphone and a free program right. you know can do just as good work as anyone else can do world-class work on a budget of next to nothing yeah. and that well, opens it up to young people. Thank we're you about so to much. do rich a production that is not going to be not for nothing and it's going to be huge and you're going to be in it and we're going to all have a jolly wonderful time and i'm looking forward to the future uh just as much as i ever have oh, and and, and because we've been on for two hours that's yeah. my last word we'll talk thank again you. later yes. yeah. thank you so uh, much audio theater is, is an so art much. form and it's in its own right uh, independent of its media yep. and it is alive and well and that's my last Word. Thank you so much, David Osman. Thank you so much, Richard Fish. What a joy it is to meet both of you here on the radio and the, the Zoom. And I hope to talk with you again soon. And I hope to keep keep in contact because you guys are national treasures. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You're so welcome. Thanks. Thank you.